This is so exciting. Woo! Psychedelics are back. I want to start by playing with the language a little bit. Why are we using the word psychedelic? We have lots of choices. When the psychedelics first came into the Western tradition, they were used by psychiatrists in the 1950s, and the word they used to describe them was psychomimetic, which means mimicking of mental illness. It didn't take them very long to realize that wasn't a very helpful way of understanding them, and the term hallucinogen was coined, which means creating visions. And then Fairly quickly, they realized that there's a lot more going on here. And the word psychedelic, which means manifesting of the mind, came along. Accessing unconscious material, understanding ourselves in a deeper way. And then other folks observed that, well, actually, when people are taking some of the psychedelics, they become enormously connected to each other. They're empathogenic. So describing them as an empathogen is appropriate. And other folks came along and said, you know, these medicines have been used for centuries for spiritual purposes. Let's honor that. Let's call it an entheogen. And the current language that we use is psychedelic, because technically it's the most accurate. Now, it comes with a huge amount of cultural baggage, the psychedelic 60s, the arts, et cetera, et cetera, but technically the word fits. So that's why we use the word psychedelic. I'd like to play with history a little bit. Psychedelics have been around for a long, long time. Ayahuasca use in the Amazon basin, either shamanistic or the UBD or the Santa Daime Church, the huicho use of peyote, the curanderos use of psilocybin mushrooms in Mexico, the, the Siberian shamanic use of Amanita muscaria are all examples of ancient traditions that we can see today that are still using these amazing medicines. I notice with great interest that if I look at all of those traditions, how they use psychedelic medicines is very consistent. The actual structure of the ceremonies differs widely. But when you look at the function of the ceremony within the context of their community, they're very similar. They're used for spirituality, healing, and celebration of transitions, everything from seasonal changes to puberty rites. And they're integrated, they're integrated within the community in a very constructive and positive way. If I was going to use one word to describe that integration, the word that I would use is pro-social. They're about connecting, connecting people with each other, with their communities, with their spirituality, and with their healing processes, and with their leaders with their elders. Now, there's also Canadian history. Did you know? I, this is a serious question. I want you to put up your hand. If you knew that the word psychedelic was coined in Canada. Yes? Oh, we have an informed group. OK. Um, if you want to fathom hell or soar angelic, take a pinch of psychedelic according to psychiatrist Humphrey Osborne. So the, the best history, the best historian who's kind of digging out Canadian history is Erica Dick. And she's a high-level historian, and she's doing a fabulous job. And this book was her first. And as a result of many academic articles, um, there's a, there was a hospital in Vancouver called Hollywood Hospital that she now has the records for. She's the only person that's been allowed to photograph them all. And so she's digging out the history of Hollywood Hospital in Vancouver. So she's an amazing historian, and she's pulling back our history. I mean, it's interesting because, total self-disclosure, my girlfriend is a psychiatrist. And she's a relatively recently graduated psychiatrist, and at no point were psychedelics ever mentioned in her medical career. And yet it played a really pivotal role in the psychiatric profession for about 15 years in Canada. And that's documented in detail here. And so essentially we're bringing back to that profession their own history. Did you know that there were two Nobel Prize winners who certainly honored the role that LSD played in their process of creation, specifically Francis Crick, the double helix of the DNA, 
and Kerry Mulis, the polymer's chain reaction was what they got the Nobel Prize for, and it was, um, LSD was part of their lives before it was criminalized. How many of you knew that Bill W. appreciated LSD? Yes, 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 okay. So Bill W. started Alcoholics Anonymous, AA, and not a, he, didn't start, he didn't start AA because of LSD, but later on, after he had started LSD, after he had started AA, he discovered LSD, and he spoke very favorably about it. And he went to his community and he said, this might be useful, this might be helpful in the spiritual transition that alcoholics need in order to achieve what they need to achieve, which is often sobriety from alcohol. And he described his experience, and it's worth reading out. This is what Bill W. said it was like for him. Suddenly, the room lit up with a great white light. I was caught up in an ecstasy for which there are no words to describe. It seemed to me in that my mind's eye, I was on a mountain, and that a wind not of air, but of spirit, was blowing. And then it burst upon me that I am a free man. Wow, that's pretty impressive. And so it's interesting to look at the research because Terry Krebs, in her analysis of the literature, um, her meta-analysis of the alcohol literature, or LSD for alcohol literature, um, concluded that he was right. LSD seems to be very useful for alcoholism. In fact, of all of the research, there were over 2,000 publications that happened out of that in those 50s and early 60s years. And if I was going to conclude from all of that data, I think that LSD for alcoholism was what they came up with. And so one of my little fantasy roles for MAPS Canada is we will eventually go back and explore that. It's certainly on my agenda. Now, it's interesting to look at this particular study because um, she went back in history and dug out all of the stuff that looked at how people were working with LSD and alcoholism. And in spite of the fact that some of the research was appalling, some of, they didn't understand the concepts of set and setting. You know, they would give people high dosages of LSD and then strap them to a gurney. You know, oh! Very unskillfully, yeah, back, back, yeah. So, it, but in spite of that, in spite of the fact they really didn't know what they were doing back then, they demonstrated benefit. So another piece of our history, why, why were psychedelics criminalized? And the truth of the matter is they were not criminalized because they were harmful. There was no evidence that said these things are a problem. In fact, all of the evidence said they seemed to do benefit. They were criminalized because of the cultural divide. And the cultural divide was the opposite of what the indigenous history was. The cultural divide somehow pitted psychedelics as an anti-social message. Tune in, turn on, and drop out was the message. And there was a reaction to that message. In the background of the Vietnam War was a problem. There was this, the, the hippies, the baby boomers, were in conflict with the status quo, the people in power. And what happened was what often happens, is the drugs of the people who were being marginalized were criminalized. It had nothing to do with the drugs themselves. And there was propaganda. This process of cultural change was happening, and there was lots of propaganda. You know, things like um, LSD will damage your chromosomes. You'll give, you'll give birth to, to damaged babies. Slide aside, I found a woman who, quote, snorted a line of LSD. She thought it was cocaine. We think she took about 20,000 dosages. Now, I haven't talked to her yet, but I've had a phone call with her, and I want, I want to write it up, but she was pregnant at the time. She was in her first trimester, and um, her baby's just fine. So it appears that it wasn't true. And the media, the media played a role. <laughs> LSD fed ape. <laughs> Rapes TV actress. LSD made me a prostitute. Girl gives birth to frog. 
Doctors blame LSD. Cultural hysteria reigned. And it was a problem. Because not only was this drug criminalized, but the research, the science was shut down. So, at what other times in history, if I reflect back on history, when has science been banned? When has a culture, a community, a, an establishment, a government said, you can't do that research, it's not okay? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because I can think of an example. In 1616, the science of the telescope was banned. You could not report what you saw peering through the lens and specifically saying that the Earth was not the center of the universe was unacceptable to the status quo people who dominated. And that particular banning went on for 143 years. LSD is to the study of the mind, what the telescope is to astronomy, and what the microscope is to biology, according to Stanislav Grof. Well, psychedelics are back. So if I was going to date the beginning of the psychedelic renaissance, personally, I would choose April 11, 2010. Now, that's not when the first research was published. That was the first time the New York Times, arguably one of the leading journals, media journals on the planet or newspapers on the planet, gave a favorable review of psychedelics. Hallucinogens have doctors tuning in again. So it's, it's interesting to track the media a little bit, especially the leading media. So this was, this was the first. But subsequently, the New York Times also, the New York Times Magazine, how psychedelics drugs can help patients face, face death. 2012, 2014, New York Times again, can mushrooms treat depression? The New Yorker, the trip treatment, 2015. But these are American, we're not American, we're Canadian. Let's talk about the Canadian leading journal, or leading newspaper, um, the Globe and Mail. Psychedelic drugs may be helpful in treating addiction, anxiety, and PTSD. 2015, Newsweek. Psychedelics promise a paradigm shift in treating mental illness. And I've always kind of liked McLean's, you know, our national magazine once a week. Is ecstasy an answer? Well, depends what the question is. <laughs> the New Yorker, this is recent stuff, 2018, the science, the new science of psychedelic renaissance. And then how many people have read Michael Pollan's book? Yes, yes. It's one of those change mo moments in cultural change shift. Michael Pollan, as you probably know, is a hugely popular author, The Omnivore's D D Dilemma, and he wrote about both his personal experience and he analyzed the research quite well. So he really brought psychedelics into the popular culture in a way that not many people could have. So it's been a huge shift. Um, my, certainly the emails that I get, I'm, I'm inundated with emails all day long, the number has gone up since Michael Pollan's book. So, speaking of media, we were speaking of media, were we? Speaking of media, did you know Fox News has been favorable? <laughs> really? MDMA for PTSD, how ecstasy ingredient works on the brain. So what we see is the media has given psychedelics a pretty fair shift. You know, it's, it's actually wonderful how they've reported on psychedelic medicine and on the research. Looking at the number of universities who are active in some way in generating something to do with psychedelics. Now, there's one university missing from this, which is UBC, University of British Columbia, because they are um, involved with the MDMA study now. They're, uh, it's their ethics review board that is going through. So this is an impressive slide. This is not just one radical university. This is mainstream. If I had one slide to show you to legitimize psychedelic research, this is the slide I would show you. The Canadian Medical Association Journal is the conservative voice of physicians across Canada. And the fact that they chose to put psychedelics on 
their front cover is a significant statement that the psychedelic renaissance is alive and well. And there were two articles in here that explored the, the recent history of what's been published uh, in the realm of psychedelics. The psychiatric annals analysis explores potential for psychedelic treatments of mental illness. Here's one by Ben Sessa, who's a psychiatrist. Are psychedelic drugs seen come back in psychiatry? Here's another one, Psychi psychedelic healing, hallucinogenic drugs which blew the mind in the 60s soon may be used to treat mental illness. Scientific American world. So I want to talk about psychedelics generally and kind of explore from a taxonomical perspective how do we understand them. Because there's the classical psychedelics, LSD, mescaline, psilocybin, dimethyltryptamine. And they've been around for a long time. What do they offer? A sense of spirituality. Often people have a sense of connection. It's kind of generic spirituality. Christians find Christ. Jesus. Buddhist, Buddhist, Buddhists find the Buddha. And agnostics and atheists find the entire universe. There's a disorientation of the ego, which is actually quite helpful for some things, things like treatment of alcoholism. There are unconscious amplifiers. You have access to stuff in the unconscious mind that we do not normally have access to. There's this thing called the portal effect. When people take one of these psychedelics in a sufficient dosage, often the experience at the end of it is, wow. It's a bit like graduating from high school or climbing Mount Everest as a sense of huge accomplishment. And that sense of huge accomplishment is really helpful in a transitionary process. If somebody is involved with healing for something, that feeling of transition is really helpful in the process. Substance use disorder treatment, depression treatment, end of life anxiety treatment are things that are being explored for. And then there's the empathogens, the root of that word is connection with others, or intactogens, which is, means connection to self. Examples are MDA, MDMA, and 3-MMC, 3-methylmethcathinone. And the main thing that these offer are connections with others, and certainly a profound sense of reflection on self. They reduce fear and therefore are incredibly helpful in the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. And then there's everything else. You know, there's things like ibogaine. I think we're going to have a talk about that later. Um, there's the ketamine experience, 2CB, Salvadoria divinorum, and they offer a whole variety of different things. Um, detoxification, ibogaine, um, substance use disorder treatment, um, ibogaine, treatment for depression, ketamine. So just this is the grab bag of everything that doesn't fit in the other two categories. So I want to talk about the study that I'm involved with, which is the MDMA study, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And it started with Michael Mithoffer's work. Now, PTSD is really hard to treat. I went to the SIMVER conference, which is the Canadian Medical Health Conference, which was a five-day event of people essentially pitching their PTSD treatments to the military. That's essentially what the conference is all about. And so walking around for five days listening to people who want to sell some PTSD treatment to the military, and what I got was the most optimistic statement as to their success rates was 25%. The science says it's about 10%. But it's not that simple because the dropout rate is high. Why is that? Young men who come back from battle are not doing well, go to get PTSD treatment, and what happens is their traumatic experiences are recreated for them. It's called prolonged exposure or flooding. And the assumption is if you just hang out in that place of trauma enough, you will desensitize. Most people don't want to have their trauma experiences stimulated. So the dropout rate is high. So it's not very effective. The dropout rate is high, and it takes a long time. It takes years. Michael Mithoffer, in his first study, d demonstrated an 83% level of effectiveness 
I'm going to say that again. 83% level of effectiveness in three months. And the dropout rate was zero. So if you're a researcher and you are looking at somebody like me saying that statement, you would say that the difference between 10%, 25%, and 83%, that's too big. Because usually when somebody comes along to offer treatment that's offered in opposition to some other treatment or an alternative to some other treatment, you usually talk about one, two, three, maybe four or five percent increase. To go from 25 to 83, essentially what you would say is that person is lying. They are falsifying their data. This can't be real. Okay? Let's deal with that challenge. So what they did, this is the MAPS community, um, so what they did is they expanded. And so they went to a whole bunch of other therapists and they trained them. And then they did the phase, we're working on the process, but this was the phase two clinical trial. So how did phase two work out for the MAPS community? So the first dosage that they took, this is um, measuring PTSD with called the CAP scale. C-A-P-S, clinically administered PTSD scale. So that's the measurement that's being used. In the first round, they noticed a 23% improvement. After a two-month follow-up, it had gone up to 55%. And after the end of three sessions, it had gone up to 61 And then all subjects that follow-up went up to 67%. 67%. 67%. And this was with a whole range of different therapists in many different cities, including Canada, Vancouver. So it seems that Michael Mithoffer was not lying. It seems like what he was actually saying was true. It seems like there was a remarkable ability to hear, here to heal people from post-traumatic stress disorder. So just giving you an update, in Vancouver, we completed our phase two study. We treated six people. Um, there were two teams of therapists. We are now gearing up for our phase three study. We hope to do 10 to 20 people. We have three teams of therapists, and we're doing it within the context of an organization called the BCCSU, the British Columbia Center on Substance Use. So we needed an organization to host us, and so they graciously took us on, which is quite wonderful for us. It was a big score. So why do therapists work with psychedelics? I want to kind of just touch base on some of the things I talked about before, but a little bit different. There's an increase of permeability between the conscious and the unconscious mind. We have access to stuff in our unconscious minds we don't normally have access to. We live a lot of our lives unconsciously. We drive our cars unconsciously. When we are driving our cars, we're not thinking about our left or right foot, depending on whether it's a standard or a non. We tend to think about lunch and what we're going to do for dinner and you know, what we're going to do at a meeting we're about to attend. So what happens when something is in our unconscious mind, a tape loop that we can't access, especially if it's problematic? Therapists have been trying to answer that question for a long, long time, and it seems like the answer is skillful use of psychedelics. And there also seems to be something to do with just unconscious conflict and distress gets resolved. There's a reduction of fear. Now, that's a huge one, especially for PTSD. When traditional therapies get close to that unconscious PTSD tape loop, there's a huge fear response. So finding a way of reducing that fear to allow the process to rework that tape loop, you need something that will take away the fear, and MDMA works really well for that. The portal effect I talk about, useful, useful process in honoring a transition. Detoxification, substance use disorder treatment, spiritual experiences and connection to others. One of the greatest predictors of success of any therapy is the alliance between the therapist and the subject or the patient or whatever you want to call that other person. The connection between those two people is vital for any therapy to succeed. Empathogens build connection. So an empathogenic medicine is exactly what you need to enhance a therapy. And yes, the researchers have looked at it and said, yes, this is actually an empathogen. It isn't just um, 
people getting together at the end of a party and saying, you know, I felt really connected. No. It's actually the science has documented that it is an empathogen. Now, one of my more interesting experiences in walking this journey is I, I took a round of the MAPS training, the MAPS therapy training. And I, what it, essentially what it was is we sat down with Michael Mithoffer, about 15 of us sat down for five days with Michael Mithoffer and watched him do his work on videotape. In fact, we had to sit there for about 12 hours a day till it was, the chairs were not comfortable. Oh my God, it was so sore. But we just watched videotapes until we dropped of Michael doing the work that he did. And it was amazing to watch. And partly, I had one of my illusions blown out of the water. I hadn't really realized I had thought it through, but I, who I saw on the videotapes completely surprised me. You can't tell anybody this, can you? This, this is just between us. If I was setting it up, I probably would have cherry-picked. I probably would have tried to find single incident trauma veterans who had had one bad experience and came back traumatized. Young, healthy men who then had this huge significant event. And complex trauma, I've worked in the addiction services wor world for so long, I know how difficult complex trauma is to treat. And who I saw on the videotapes were not simple trauma, they were complex trauma. And I'll give you two examples of who we saw. There was a male who was a first responder and he was at the 9-11 event. And it got worse from there. Can you imagine getting worse? It did. And it was really bad what happened to him. And I, we saw everything. We saw the first interview, we saw the first session, we saw everything. The first interview, he was delusional. Now, psychosis is an exclusion criteria. But Michael Mithoffer didn't see psychosis, he saw PTSD. And he was right, because he was cured. He, he was on 21 psychiatric medications over a four-year process. That's worth repeating, 21. And he was completely delusional, and he was cured. And at the end of it, he, uh, he returned to work. Now, for those folks who know Vancouver, we have a, an open drug scene. We have a marginalized group of people who live within a few blocks of each other. And I've worked there, and it's a trauma population. And I thought I had heard all of the stories. I thought I had heard an absolutely obnoxious stories of what happens to people. But the story for the woman, the second case down here, the story that she told, I believe was the most difficult story I've ever heard. I won't share details, because I'd have to debrief you all, but certainly when we heard her story, Michael had to turn off the tape and allow us all to breathe for a while and kind of bring us back to being able to focus. This was skilled, seasoned therapists had a big emotional reaction to even to listening to what she said. Her story was so obnoxious. And it was an abuse story. It was a multiple abuse story that started very young in her life. And she received the treatment, and she lived in the area where the training was. So she came and met us. And so here was somebody that would, I believed would have looked like somebody who lives in the downtown east side of Vancouver, and just looks like a trauma person. You know, there's a certain appearance. And she was well-groomed and articulate and thoughtful and self-disclosing and engaging of us. I so appreciated her. It was remarkable meeting her, given what I had seen on her videotapes. And she was the most complex trauma that I could imagine. So I want to just kind of explore some of the other research. The antidepressive, anxiolytic, and anti-addictive effects of ayahuasca, psilocybin, and LSD, a systematic review of clinical trials published in the last 25 years. Essentially, mood disorders and addictions for the classical psychedelics. What do they do? And the answer is, they seem to be very useful. Because I've worked in the addictions world, it's interesting to look at some of the addictions research. So here was a tobacco cessation study. Now, as we know, tobacco is really hard to quit. It's a nasty addiction. And the most effective treatments today are less than 30% effective. So here was Johnson and Griffiths, 
And they took, it was a small N study, it was 15 people. But of the 15 people, 12, which is 80%, became abstinence from tobacco. That's a wow. Again, addictions treatment, psilocybin-assisted treatment for alcohol dependence, a proof of concept study. It appears to be very helpful. This is one of my favorite studies, partly because it was really out of the box. It was different. And what, what we observe is that often the treatment effect, whatever they're looking for, be it addiction treatment, et cetera, often the treatment effect is mediated by a sense of spirituality. The extent to which people have a sense of spirituality is the extent to which they recover. So Griffiths decided to try and measure the spirituality directly. And then he went back 14 months later and said, let's look and see what happened to those people that were part of our study. Now, I'm going to apologize for this next slide. From a presenter's point of view, this is slide from hell. This is what you're not supposed to do, and I'd like to acknowledge that. But the numbers are so important. I want to just point out some numbers. So what we have here, we had to look at these two columns. We're going to look at the 30 column, which is 30 milligrams. 30 milligrams of psilocybin is approximately uh, 6 grams of dried expensive mushrooms. So we're going, to look at the, uh, we're going to look at the 30 milligram column, and then we're going to look at the column to the right of that, which is the 14 months later column. Specifically, I'd like to draw your attention to a number of lines. And we're looking at positive attitudes to life, positive attitudes about self, positive mood changes, increased spirituality, and how meaningful this experience was and how spiritual experience these, ex this experience was. And what is absolutely unique about this research is they had a profound experience and it was often the most meaningful or the most spiritual experience of their lives, which is amazing. But the effect 14 months later went up. Now, can you think of anything that you've ever done in terms of medicine where you go get something done and the effect of the treatment increases 14 months later? Uh, it's unparalleled. It's quite something. Now, a couple of other pieces of research that I just have to comment on. So far, everything I've talked about is really highly structured, highly contained, supervised, carefully constructed psychedelic use. And yes, we demonstrate benefit. But what about psychedelic use that occurs in the population at large? Naturalistic use is the, the uh, research buzzword. And I want to talk about two studies that Hendricks did. And the first one had an N of 25,000. This is the stu his study of recidivism. Now, as you know, that means people who are involved with recidivism have been in jail and they go back to jail. That's the process of recidivism. So what prevents recidivism? What stops people from going back to jail? In our society, generally, if I just started quizzing you about what helps people not go back to jail, what you would tell me is stable family, housing and employment. And you're right. When he looked at people who had stable family, housing and employment, it was protective against recidivism. And then he looked at drug use. Because you really have nothing to hide when you're going to jail anyway, and somebody asks you a bunch of questions, you may as well just tell them the truth, because at that point it doesn't matter. And he looked at how drug use affected recidivism. And what he noticed is that people who smoke crack cocaine tend to go back to jail more quickly than other folks. OK, that kind of makes sense. And then he looked at naturalistic use of psychedelics. And what he found was that people who use psychedelics appear to have a more protective effect than stable family housing, and employment. Wow. So he was so interested in this as an effect, he said, is this just um, prisons only? So he went into the National Health Survey database, huge study in the United States that had 190,000 records he was able to access. And he draw a correlation between 
suicide ideation and attempting suicide and use of psychedelics. And what he found is that psychedelics seem to have a protective effect in terms of people's suicidality. Now this one I just wanted to show you because I think the title is so incredibly cool. <laughs> the efficacy, tolerability, and safety of serotonergic psychedelics for the management of mood, anxiety, and substance use disorders. A systematic review <laughs> of systematic reviews. <laughs> you gotta love it. You gotta love academics. You just, that's beautiful. <laughs> this is the definitive statement. It covers everything. <laughs> and, and what we see from um, Dos Santos' work is that what we see is that it seems to offer benefits. Psychedelic use seem to offer benefit for a wide, wide variety, and they also seem to be safe. They're safe, they're tolerable, and they are effective. Now, I want to talk about this study because it produced an image that you're probably very familiar with. So this was um, Petri et al who took David Nutt, who's a neuroscientist in the UK. David Nutt puts people in these large machines that analyze people's brains when they're on psychedelics. And he generated a bunch of data that he gave to this group of researchers, who then did this piece of research and came up with this image. Now, I'd like to acknowledge this image was something that he, what's the right word, inferred from the data. Um, it, this is not an image based on hard science. But I think it's a useful image. I think it's an image that really helps us to start to understand what psychedelics are doing. So the image on the left is the normal human brain. And the outside of it, the different colors, are different parts of the human brain. And what we see is that the, the visual cortex, for example, talks a lot to the visual cortex and not a lot to the other parts of the human brain. And the image on the right, what we see is a whole lot of new connections get formed. And I think that's a very useful explanation as to why we see all the positive effects that we see from psychedelic medicines. Psychedelics are really all about connections. <coughs> connections with self, connection with others, connections with meaning and purpose to life, connection with spirituality, connection with family, connection with friends. I'd like to reflect a little bit on the fact that psychedelics are becoming legalized, but the vehicle for their legalization is a little different from the other vehicles of legalization. Cannabis is being legalized in Canada. And the, why is cannabis being legalized? Well, it wasn't legalized because of what Normal, the National Organization for the Reform of Cannabis Laws, did for many years, which was arguing a human rights argument. You don't have a right to put me in jail for what I'm voluntarily doing to my own body, was essentially their argument. And it didn't change anything. What changed things is when mom started showing up saying, I have a right to access this medicine for my child who has epilepsy. And then slowly, when, medicine, when cannabis became a medicine, what we saw is a shift in the polls. And I kind of tracked these things. And I watched every single year it go up until it hit over 50% of Canadians thought that cannabis should be legalized. And then Justin Trudeau got on the podium and said, we're going to do this thing. He just read the polls. And he reflected what people want. Opiates, there is a, an intense discussion happening now around opiate legalization. It's not called that. It's called safe access. But essentially, people are dying. And it's not a fentanyl crisis, it's a drug prohibition crisis. If people had access to clean opiate drugs, they wouldn't die. And so slowly, that message is getting into the bureaucrats of the world and the healthcare practitioners. And so we have a public dialogue happening around, it's not called legalization, but that's essentially what we need to do. So again, that's kind of the vehicle for opiates. But the, the vehicle for psychedelics is different. It's going through the stage one, two, and three clinical trials. We're turning psychedelics into a medicine. But the backdrop of the public support because of the other challenges to drug prohibition are significant. So there's a cultural context for it as well, which is supportive. I want to talk about the future. 
So here was a paper I wrote. How much do I have? How much time do I have? Eight minutes, okay. That works. So one of the things that I do is I articulate post-prohibition models for the regulation and control of all currently illegal drugs based on public health principles. So when I peer through the lens of public health, what I say is this is how this drug would look like if we stopped doing this thing called drug prohibition. And this was my paper on psychedelics. The model for all drugs is different. How we legalize cannabis should be different from how we work with crack cocaine, should be different from how we work with psychedelics. So this was my recommendation for the model. So I want to kind of explore what it took to put this paper together. And just acknowledging who else wrote, it, wrote this with me, um, Brian Emerson is, works in the Ministry of Health. He works with our medical health officer, and he's a leader in the public health field um, of British Columbia. And Ken Tupper at that time was a Ministry of Health bureaucrat who got both his master's and his PhD in ayahuasca. But um, we got together and wrote this paper. And what we observed is that if you look at all drugs, all drugs have the potential for harm. So what, how do you break those harms down? Well, they are the impurities is one potential harm. Toxicity is another potential harm. Addiction is another potential harm. And behavior that people do when they're on the drug is another potential harm. So let's take that model and look at psychedelics. So yes, in the criminal world, you don't know what you're buying. So in a legal world, that would be taken care of because they'd be regulated. The toxicity of psychedelics is incredibly low. And I'm doing both a microdosing study, but I'm also, as I mentioned, I'm really interested in people who do accidental overdoses. And they take thousands of whatever, either thousands of dosages or thousands of micrograms. And, and so I, I found a group of people who did an LSD overdose. Um, accidentally, they took 10 times what they thought they were doing. The people who wanted to do 100 mics did 1,000. People who wanted to do 200 mics did 2,000. And um, it was an event, and it, it was a problem. And, and so what happened? I'm trying to track those people down and have conversations with them. And so far, I've only talked to people who uh, it was difficult at the time. In fact, it was extremely difficult at the time. But there seemed to be some positive health outcomes that came from that experience. But what we can observe very clearly is nobody died. And so we can find people who have done tens and sometimes thousands of times the dosage that they should have done, and they don't die. If you did a 1,000 times the dosage of water, what's, what's a dosage of water, like three cups a day? If you did multiply that by a 1,000, it would kill you. you know, can you name a drug that you can do a 1,000 of and not die? Well, maybe not. So what we see with the classical psychedelics is they're incredibly lo low toxicity. I worked for the addiction services for 30 years. Nobody walked in my office saying, I can't stop taking LSD. <laughs> Never happened. So the dependency potential is really low. So it really comes down to one problem. The problem that we observe with psychedelics is essentially lack of supervision. It's lack of control of set and setting. It's lack of wise oversight. It's people just behaving really badly in when they take the psychedelic. So given that that's the only problem with psychedelics is lack of supervision, what we should do is we should create a new profession. And they should be called psychedelic supervisors. Now, in our paper, we argue for a new bureaucratic oversight of, that manages all currently illegal drugs. We call it the Psychoactive Substances Commission. So it's underneath that. There'll be one wing for cannabis, one wing for opiates, and one wing for psychedelics. And there should be a professional body created. By professional, I mean they would be responsible to oversight. They'd be trained, similar to physicians and accountants and veterinarians. And if you have a problem with what they've done, you can go to their professional body and you can complain. They can charge you for the practice. They would have to adhere to best practices. They could have specialties. An ayahuasca ceremony could be a specialty. Managing a multi-day music festival could be a specialty. Having post-traumatic stress disorder treatment could be a specialty. Now, these folks would be responsible for 
essentially supervising the person eight hours after ingestion. They're also responsible for screening. Psychedelic use is not for everybody. And so screening the people who shouldn't do it out would be important. Working with people around dosage issues. And they'd be responsible for set and setting for eight hours after ingestion. They'd have to be responsible for managing interactions between people, because sometimes you don't want to listen to what's going on for somebody else in the middle of a whatever experience. And managing difficult experiences. Some people have challenges. You know, it's not uncommon that some people cathart emotionally when they're having a psychedelic experience. And you have to be there for them. And they would have to agree to work with other professionals to help develop and train other professionals, to develop best practices and train other professionals. Now, this paper took a long time to write, partly because I would present this idea at conferences. And somebody would inevitably get up at the back and say, well, that's an interesting idea. I love psychedelics. And what I do with my girlfriend when I take a psychedelic with her, I don't want supervised. <laughs> and so I really had to wrap my head around that. And so we came up with two streams. We came up with a certification stream, which means essentially if you want to self-supervise or supervise some friends, what you need to do is a basic level of training, which is probably a couple of weekends. So the first weekend focuses on the knowledge base, and the second weekend focuses on a, an experience. And so once you've been trained and you can answer some questions, you know, what does it mean to control for set? What does it mean, which is expectation? What does it mean to control for setting, which is the environment? And if you pass the test, then yes, you can walk into one of these facilities and you can purchase psychedelic use, essentially for take home use. How long do I have? Last minute. So I'm going to just throw this slide up as a teaser, because I'm on a panel at the end of the day. So I'm not going to talk about it. But the most challenging piece of the slide, or the, the paper that we wrote, was what do we think about youth access? How should youth be able to access in this new model? And we went through all kinds of gymnastics to come up with an answer. And I'm going to talk about that later, because I got 60 seconds. But it was a challenge. It's something that we really had to wrap our heads around. So essentially, what we're talking about here is we are advocating for a licensed profession. Now, I noticed some people taking pictures of the slides. One thing about me is I, I uh, allow people to access my slides. You can have them. And in fact, they're on my website, and, and I don't PDF them. So what you do with them is up to you. I give all of my materials away for free. So this is where we're going. The direction that we're heading in is towards a professional body that supervises people taking psychedelics. In fact, if you want an image as to where we're going, this is what the image looks like. <laughs> now, I know some of you are thinking that's way too urban. OK, how about this? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 